Hi class. In our last week, we're going to be discussing um, methods to obtain asymptotic approximations directly from a differential equation. Up to now, we've been talking about the asymptotic uh, evaluation of integrals, and we've developed various techniques like Laplace's method, the method of stationary phase, or steepest descent. But in many cases, um, what one has is actually a differential equation that one is trying to solve. And um, in particular, asymptotic methods are um, important for a kind of perturbation theory called singular perturbation theory. And that's best illustrated by an example. Suppose we have a second order linear differential equation with, uh, with non-constant coefficients. Uh, so you have some parameter epsilon, which we'll take to be small in a moment, d squared y by dx squared plus a of x dy by dx plus b of x y equals zero, subject to, say, the boundary conditions y of zero is a and y of one equals b. Now, you can see that the character of the differential equation changes sensitively depending on whether uh, epsilon is small and non-zero or exactly zero. If it's small and non-zero, this is a second order linear differential equation, we expect that there are two solutions. In fact, we need two solutions in order to be able to satisfy both boundary conditions. If we set epsilon equal to zero, however, the character of the differential equation changes, and the differential equation becomes a first order equation, just a of x dy by dx plus b of x y equals zero, and it's actually not even possible in general to solve such a first order equation subject to two boundary conditions. So the limit epsilon goes to zero is a singular perturbation. That is, uh, when you try to do an expansion for small values of epsilon, you can't actually continuously or smoothly deform around epsilon equals zero, because epsilon equals zero is a first order equation, which is very different than the behavior when epsilon is non-zero. Nonetheless, as we will see, you can actually get an asymptotic of uh, expansion for the solutions to the differential equation in epsilon. Um, before we go into detail about how to actually derive those asymptotic uh, expansions, let's actually examine what happens in some simple cases that we can actually solve. So let's take a case with constant coefficients. So epsilon d squared y by dx squared plus dy dx plus y equals zero. So a of x is a constant one and b of x is also equal to one. Notice that this constant uh, for a is actually greater than zero. That's going to matter in a moment. And let's take the boundary conditions y of zero is zero and y of one is one. We know how to solve an equation of this form. This is just a linear second order differential equation with constant uh, coefficients. So we try a solution in the form e to the lambda x. We get the characteristic equation, ep epsilon lambda squared plus lambda plus one equals zero. Notice that this quadratic equation for a quadratic characteristic equation also has the property that it's discontinuous in its behavior as epsilon goes to zero. If epsilon is strictly equal to zero, it's a linear equation. If epsilon is non-zero, it's a quadratic equation. But we can solve this exactly using the quadratic formula. So, you know, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, where this uh, a is, is epsilon here, which we can expand. We can expand the square root using the binomial theorem. And here, are we, here we see the two kinds of characteristic uh, exponents that we get. One of them is just minus one plus the terms of order epsilon is very smooth as epsilon goes to zero. We could have expected that if we were to set epsilon equal to zero, the solution is just lambda equals minus one. But the second solution blows up. It goes like minus one over epsilon. That means that to the extent that we need the second solution, there's going to be behavior in this solution which varies rapidly with x. It's going to have powers of e to the x over epsilon in it. So in fact, this is sort of the, the most general solution then. It's uh, the form a e to the minus x coming from this term and b e to the x minus x over epsilon coming from the second uh, coefficient. Here we've approximated, we're not, we're not using the exact form of the, uh, of the roots of the characteristic equation, just the approximate ones. But we can then solve the um, boundary conditions, y of zero is zero, so a plus b is zero, y of one is one, so a e to the minus one plus b e to the one minus one over epsilon is equal to one. But notice that this term for epsilon small is very, very small because e to the minus one over epsilon is e to the minus one over, e to the minus some very large number, and therefore it, it's, it's negligible. And if we plug in, therefore, uh, if, I, um, if I divide through by e to the minus one, divide this equation through by e to the minus one, I get a plus b e to the one minus one over epsilon over e to the minus one, um, and, and that has to equal e, uh, and so, and I, I plug in from here that a is equal to minus b, so I can solve for, the, for, for b, 
which is 1 over e to the 1 minus 1 over epsilon minus e to the minus 1, and that's equal to minus a. So the approximate solution for y of x is e to the x minus x over epsilon minus e to the minus x over a normalization factor, e to the minus 1 over epsilon, e to the minus 1 minus 1 over epsilon minus e to the minus 1. If you plot this solution, here's the solution for epsilon equals 110, here's the solution for epsilon equals 1 over 100, you'll see that it, it has a region which, where it varies very rapidly, very steeply rises from 0, which is the boundary condition at y equals 0, up to some maximum value, and then smoothly um, uh, goes to 0, or goes, uh, goes to the value 1 as x goes to, uh, x goes to 1. So what we expect um, and in general, what happens in equations of this for form is there can be a boundary layer, a layer where the solution varies very rapidly as a function of x, and it matches onto a smooth outer solution, an outer solution where the function varies much more slow, slowly. Now, for we had a case here where a is greater than zero, and we found a boundary condition or a boundary layer near x equals zero. What happens if a is negative one instead, so less than zero? We can go through exactly the same steps. We have the characteristic equation. Here's the solution. We can apply the boundary conditions. And here's the solution that we get. And here we find the boundary condition instead happens at x equals one instead of x equals zero. So the sign, S-I-G-N sign, of the coefficient a determines whether the boundary layer happens on the left or on the right, and, but the, the, the characteristic form of the solution is to have a boundary layer on one side and a smooth solution uh, on the other side, an outer solution. Well, the limiting case between a positive and negative is a equal to zero, so let's examine that. If a equals zero, this becomes essentially a harmonic oscillator equation with a spring constant proportional to one over epsilon. We can solve this equation exactly. So you get a sine x over the square root of epsilon plus b cosine x over the square root of epsilon. Notice that because a is 0, now the scale of variation is neither 1 nor epsilon, but in fact the square root of epsilon. We can, um, we can impose the same boundary conditions. And here's the solution. y of x is sine of x over the square root of epsilon over sine of 1 over the square root of epsilon. So it oscillates more and more wildly as epsilon goes to 0. So here's the solution for epsilon equals 1,000. Here's the solution for epsilon equals 10. We get a very different kind of solution. Instead of having an, a boundary layer, um, in general, we have diff a, a solution that's oscillatory. So if we go back to the original equation, we can kind of understand what's going on more generally. And this is a, a, a an approximation, a way of analyzing the equation uh, that we'll talk about at the end when we talk about the WKB approximation. But let's go back to our original uh, equation, epsilon d squared y by dx squared plus a of x dy dx plus b of x y equals zero. Um, in the case where a is not zero, we expect there to be a boundary layer. In the case where a equals zero, we expect to get an oscillating solution. We can actually analyze both of those cases by assuming the form of the um, solution y is e to the s of x uh, divided by delta. You may remember that we actually use this kind of a solution when we're trying to analyze uh, the form of the asymptotic uh, behavior of differential equations near an irregular singular point. Here we're using it to obtain the asymptotic expansion in some small parameter ultimately related to epsilon, but we've introduced a small parameter delta in order to characterize uh, the expansion. Here's y prime and y double prime. If we plug this in, just as we did before, we're going to get a nonlinear differential equation for the function s instead. And you'll notice there's different kinds of terms that appear here. So if we assume that b and a are of order 1 and that epsilon and delta are small, we see that because um, epsilon over delta um, uh, sorry, epsilon over delta squared has, uh, differs from epsilon over delta by one power of one over delta, we generally expect this first term to dominate over the second term if epsilon and delta are small. Furthermore, on, if we look at the second two terms, a of del over delta s prime plus b, then um, b if b and a are of order one, a over delta is going to always be greater than uh, b, so we expect that we might approximate the solution. I've put a, a subscript zero to uh, emphasize that this is kind of the leading order of some, what's eventually going to be an asymptotic expansion for S. Um, and the leading expansion is uh, leading, if I, if I neglect the second term and the fourth term, the equation becomes epsilon over delta squared S0 prime squared plus one over delta A of X S0 prime equals zero. You can see that in order to have these two be the same order of magnitude, epsilon should be of order delta. If epsilon is of order delta, 
then you get two different kinds of solutions, s prime of zero equal to minus a of x, or s prime of zero equal to zero. This corresponds to the rapidly varying boundary layer solution that we found uh, in the inner region. This piece corresponds to the, the, the solution where the, um, where the, the, in the region where uh, it's mo moving slow, it's changing slowly or is smooth. Um, and actually to, to solve this, which we, you will do on the problem set, you actually go to need to go to next order, um, but you'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the WKB approximation. So what you can see is, in general, we're going to get a, or what you will show, actually, in the problem set, and, and we'll see more in the next uh, video, is that when a of x is greater than zero, the boundary layer is on the left-hand side at x equals zero by convention. If a of x is less than zero, uh, there's going to be a boundary layer on the right-hand side. The choice of zero and one here is arbitrary. You can rescale coordinates or translate so that that's true. What matters here is that the uh, linear term is either strictly positive or strictly negative in the interval that you... Uh, that you're interested in. The boundary layer inner solution satisfies this equation and the outer solution satisfies that equation and in general what we're going to do is we're going to solve this equation to get the rapid variation of the function, we're going to solve this equation to get the smooth variation and we're going to match at the boundary layer and that boundary layer is either going to be at x equals 0 or x equals 1 depending on the sign of a and we'll talk about boundary layer theory in the next video. If a of x is strictly equal to zero, you can do the same analysis, and again, you expect this second term to be less than the first term because this has a one over delta squared, this has only a one over delta. There is no a of x term. Instead, the dominant balance is between this term and this term. If those two balance, you need epsilon over delta squared equal to uh, of order one, so delta is over the squared of epsilon, just like we found in sine of x over the squared of epsilon. And you get two kinds of solutions, s prime, uh, if, if you satisfy this, s prime squared plus b of x equals zero, so s prime is plus or minus the square root of minus b of x, so that's an oscillatory kind of solution if b is greater than zero, or an exponential solution if b is less than zero. And when we talk about the WKB approximation, we'll develop this in greater detail. Next time, I want to talk about boundary layer theory, and I want to talk about how we actually carry out this program.